Loop on the 8th would have been the third animated TV series in the Loop on franchise, which was in production in 1982. A collaboration between TMS and French animation studio Deke Entertainment that introduced a sci-fi twist to the series, it was meant to serve as the western introduction to Loop on as they planned to distribute it internationally. Not only had Deke already established a working relationship with TMS, they'd already seen success in its native region of France and had just launched an American office in California. Had the show been finished, it likely would have aired sometime in either late 1982 or 1983. Known in France as Arsène and Company, it centered around the eighth descendant of the Lupin family and was set in the 22nd century. Despite the absurd premise, it actually did make a lot of sense considering the time period and Deke's history up to that point. Deke needs little introduction, being responsible for series like Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, The Super Mario Bros. Super Show, Captain Planet, and countless others. In 1981, they partnered with TMS to create Ulysses 31, a science fiction series based on the classic story of the Odyssey that aired in both Japan and France and was a moderate hit for the companies, likely partially due to the popularity of sci-fi. In the early 80s, science fiction was exploding as a film genre thanks to Star Wars Episodes 4 and 5, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, Blade Runner, Alien, E.T. The Extraterrestrial, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind all achieving box office success and critical acclaim. Even for anime, the genre was in sort of a golden age with shows like the 1980 Astro Boy series, Space Adventure Cobra, and Galaxy Express 999 debuting around this time. Thus, when Deke pitched a sci-fi series starring the descendant of their famous Master Thief, TMS was happy to work with Deke on the idea. A number of recognizable faces were involved during production, including Lupin Part 2 writer Yutaka Kaneko, Lupin Part 3 animation director Shingo Araki, who worked on character designs, and Captain Harlock director Rintaro. Monkey Punch even drew some initial designs, but his contributions ended there, and the final designs ultimately made several changes from his art. From the outset, TMS and Deke aimed for a younger audience and made significant cutbacks to the tone to account for an international release. A number of episodes entered production, but ultimately the series was cancelled with only one episode in a mostly finished state. This episode was fully scripted and animated, although the series was canned before they could record the voice acting. For years, the show only existed as rumors in the Lupin fandom until TMS finally released the pilot episode, still without voices, on Lupin the Third Master File, a Blu-ray package released in 2012. In addition to the first episode, Master File also showed off other episodes that were partially animated at the time of shutdown. So what exactly is Lupin the Eighth, and why was it ultimately given the boot? Since we really only have one episode, let's take a brief look into it to see what we're dealing with here. The story is set, as I said, in the 22nd century, when mankind is exploring and colonizing space with a number of settlements established above Earth's atmosphere connected by a series of corridors. Arsène Lupin the Eighth works as a private detective alongside his partner, Jigen Daisuke the Sixth, with Lupin's on and off love interest, Fujiko Mine the Sixth, toying with him regarding a date, and their samurai companion, Goemon Ishikawa the Eighteenth, spending most of his time meditating in silence. Lupin and Jigen solve cases, bust criminals, and otherwise just relax and hang out inside their office, a spacefaring blimp called the Lupin that carries his detective agency around wherever he needs to go. And during his investigations, he often comes across Inspector Koichi Zenigata VI, who's convinced that Lupin is secretly a criminal posing as a detective. In the pilot episode, Lupin and Jigen are approached by a young girl named Alice who asks them to investigate her great-grandfather, Willie Dream, who's been in hibernation for 100 years. He's set to come out of his sleep the next day, and Alice wants Lupin to ensure he wakes up alright, though she's not the only one interested in reviving him. Another man named Gordon also wants to see Willie when he wakes up because, as it turns out, Willie is a thief who's stolen $10 billion worth of diamonds from the moon and only he knows where they're hidden. So it becomes a battle between Lupin and Gordon to uncover the diamonds and protect Willie's legacy. This is a decent storyline, and despite the sci-fi setting, it isn't that far removed from a traditional Lupin adventure. You've got the familiar cast, the characters of the week, and a plot that has enough mystery and action to keep it at least moderately interesting. Obviously, without the voice acting, giving this episode a full examination is impossible, but for what we have, it's not too bad. If we look at this as an indication of what the series as a whole would have looked like, it's an interesting mishmash between previous Lupin media with a smattering of sci-fi elements thrown in. 
It's a combination of the structure of a part 1 episode, being mostly slow paced with only a few action set pieces, and the tone of a part 2 episode, being softer and comedic with less character driven dialogue. It has less of an anime feel to it in terms of the pacing, though again, without a voice track, it's hard to assess that accurately. It also gives us a short look into what the world of Loop on the 8th looks like, both from an aesthetic and historical standpoint. The setting is mostly urban sci-fi, with scenes set both in outer space and in futuristic cities, but there's also a hint of old world classic design here that communicates that this isn't so far into the future. Many landmarks from our present day Earth are shown here, including the Catacombs of Paris and the Eiffel Tower, which are mostly abandoned but have been preserved in their original form. It suggests a feeling of the past through the locations the characters visit, simultaneously modern and historic, and had the series been allowed to air, we likely would have seen that more explicitly. I am a fan of sci-fi, so the pure spacefaring does appeal to me, though I imagine anyone who isn't already on board with the idea of Lupin in space might be turned off immediately. Or you'll be turned off by the changes to these classic characters, and I don't just mean putting them in spacesuits and changing their outfits up a bit. A lot of elements do carry over, like Lupin's fawning over Fujiko, Lupin's cocky nature, Jigen's sharpshooting, Goemon cutting something, Fujiko being duplicitous, Zenigata's relentless obsession with Lupin, etc. Even thievery is technically still intact, although strictly performed by the villains and side characters. But making Lupin not a thief strips away a crucial aspect of his identity, and really his reason for existing, and I get this is technically a different character, but for a show that otherwise sticks pretty close to the traits of Lupin, it does seem very out of place. This goes beyond the premise as well, there's no conventional weapons, as guns and Goemon Zentetsuken have been replaced with laser based equivalents, Jigen doesn't smoke cigarettes but rather sucks on lollipops, and the violence and sex have been stripped to the bare nub. It makes sense considering this was meant for an international release and standards for western broadcasters were tighter than in Japan, but it does sever whatever ties this show had left to the soul of Lupin. But I actually don't have a problem with the direction on its own, if they couldn't have Lupin be a thief then making him a detective is the next obvious step that works with his personality. The major issue for me is that it gives people the wrong idea about the franchise as a whole. Not that anyone would make this their first taste of Lupin the Third, but it's odd how this show tries to have its Lupin cake and eat something else entirely different that tastes horrible if you eat it with the cake. As you'd expect from a show with a more Saturday morning cartoon vibe, the animation is fine at best and stiff as a board at worst. It's certainly not very exciting to look at, and occasionally it even lessens the impact of the scene with how rigid the movements are. I know this episode is unfinished, yet nothing sticks out as poor because it's not finalized, but poor because it's being designed on a budget. Deke isn't exactly known for groundbreaking animation anyway, and for what it's worth, and I don't know if this is a controversial opinion, I actually kinda like these character designs. The characters are rounder overall, softening the edges compared to works like the manga and Mystery of Mamo, and drifting closer, but not exactly, to the style of Castle of Cagliostro. I actually appreciate how these characters form their own identity while still incorporating the attributes we all know and love. They're not perfect, I especially don't like Fujiko's face here, but even though it's not animated particularly well, I can definitely get down with the look of the show. The music also partially redeems it, as this isn't a bad soundtrack at all, it's more synth based, which is to be expected, and it works fairly well. I don't know who to credit for these soundtracks though, as the composer for this show hasn't been determined, and I doubt it was Yuji Ono as it doesn't sound like his style. It's possible that it could be Denny Crockett and or Ike Egan who composed music for Ulysses 31, but I have no evidence to back this up. So why was the show never finished? Well, TMS and Deke hit a snag when it came to an international release, the estate of Maurice LeBlanc. As a reminder, the Arsene Lupin name was already in the public domain in Japan, but a show designed for a western release was a different story. Consider that this would also include France, where Arsene Lupin was born, in addition to North America and the rest of Europe, so it's understandable why LeBlanc's estate was so protective. Apparently, they were willing to let Deke and TMS use the Lupin name, but for a sum of money that the companies just couldn't pay, and rather than change the name, they cancelled the project instead. Beyond the pilot, five other episodes were partially animated at the time it was cancelled, and though we don't know their full plots, we can at least get a sense for them from the scenes that were finished. 
These episodes feature Lupin fighting an evil robot doppelganger who acts more like Lupin III, Lupin going up against some guy, I couldn't figure out the plot of this one, Lupin racing in a Grand Prix because that's just what Lupin does no matter the time period, Lupin and Jigen playing American football for I'm sure a very good reason, and Zenigata having a microfilm stored in his teeth that Lupin wants to retrieve. Anyone familiar with part 1 or part 2 might recognize some of these plot points, and while they probably wouldn't have been one-to-one -one adaptations of those stories, I'm sure that the staff would look towards Lupin the Third stories for inspiration in developing Lupin the Eighth. But there was also a tie-in manga written by Ken Takigawa and drawn by Eiichi Saito, with the two working under the joint pseudonym Ori Kalkum. I'm not sure if these two created any other manga, but at one point they were both assistants to the legendary manga creator Go Nagai, who was responsible for series like Devil Man, Mazinger Z, and Cutie Honey. This manga ran for 10 chapters from 1982 to 1983 in Futabasha's monthly Hayukaten comic, and while the first chapter loosely adapts the pilot episode, most of the others either feature original plots or are based on episodes that never started production. The first six chapters were collected in a standalone volume, but the remaining four seem to be lost for now, with only the first six stories getting an unofficial English scanlation courtesy of Oranges. This manga is closer to the tone of Loop on the Third, with some of the perverted and violent Edge returning from Monkey Punch's series. Lupin himself is way more adult, despite still being a detective, he's once again a horny, slightly depraved individual, though with a bigger sense of honor. It also has some details that aren't present in the pilot, such as a character named Sherlock Holmes the Seventh, who apparently taught Loop on the Eighth everything he knows about being a detective. He appears in a few chapters, and while we don't know this for sure, may have appeared in the show past the first episode. It's far from the first time Holmes, or a Holmes descendant, has appeared alongside Lupin, and as I mentioned in my History of Lupin the Third video, even old Arsene Lupin once went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the original Sherlock Holmes. That's a tradition that's continued to this day, as Holmes was a main character in the To Be Finished The Day This Video Is Uploaded, Lupin the Third Part 6, for better or for worse. But we'll get to that show in, I don't know, 2025? Anyway, despite having a short run, the manga is actually pretty decent. The stories are weird, but fairly enjoyable, on par with the better chapters of Monkey Punch's original comics. It was surprisingly funny on occasion too, though I have to compliment both Takigawa's script and Orange's for their translation. The character designs are faithful to the show, but the poses are much more dynamic, sometimes mimicking Monkey Punch's drawing style in terms of fluidity. Saito's art isn't always stellar, as there are some odd proportions, but overall I'd say it was done pretty solidly. If you liked the pilot episode and want to see more of this universe, then give the manga a look. There's only a few chapters, and it shows off the promise of the series very well. As for the show, it's impossible to properly judge the quality of its unfinished episodes, and I suppose on some level, it's also not entirely fair to judge the series as a whole. What we can do is ponder what would have happened if it was released and how audiences might have reacted to it. And on that front, personally, I am glad that the series was cancelled. To me, Loop on the Eighth is a fascinating curiosity that was very exciting to dissect for this video, and I would have loved to have seen what it could have been if it was finished. Truth be told, I actually kinda like this idea, and even in its incomplete state, the episode that does exist wasn't bad. Unfortunately, while I can get behind the concept, it would have been a bad introduction to Lupin for the West. The idea of this being Lupin's worldwide debut is already iffy because it's a spin-off set outside the main character's time, and even if the common threads are recognizable, it would have established a specific idea on what Lupin was that isn't compatible with the rest of the franchise. In hindsight, I suppose the best course of action would have been for TMS and Deke to rename the show and make it completely unrelated to Lupin to allow the show to continue, as that would let us now fully appreciate it on its own merits, though that obviously didn't happen. Ultimately though, its cancellation paved the way for better things to rise from its ashes. As part of a means to recoup their losses on the project, Deke banked on another idea in development about a cyborg police inspector who was equipped with mechanical devices that helped him solve crimes alongside his niece and dog. And that show, Inspector Gadget, became a tremendous success. Meanwhile, TMS began production on another loop on TV series, and while they forewent a western release this time, it managed to be popular enough to air in Japan for almost two years. But we'll talk about that show, Loop on the Third, Part 3, next time.
For now, thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, give it a like, leave a comment, and make sure to subscribe and click that bell to see when new videos go live. What do you think of Loop on the 8th, and do you wish it was finished? Let me know down below, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this obscure little blip in the Lupon series. Until next time, this is Cloud Connection, signing off.